This episode brought to you by Chime, the award-winning app and debit card that can save you money today. Also brought to you by Raycon, earbuds that look, feel, and sound better than ever. In the back room where the lights don't work. Just realizing the irony of that. What is it? Something scary about this room. Oh, come on, Tamara, it's fine. I don't know. I don't know what it is. There's just always been something unsettling about it. Look, all you gotta do is take out your camera phone, turn on the light, and... <laughs> It's a Philo Barnhart. What the hell is a Philo Barnhart? Oh, uh, he's an animator that worked on a bunch of Disney and Donald Bluth films. Every studio has one. How in the hell are we supposed to know that? Well, because he worked on a lot of movies you might recognize. He worked on Beauty and the Beast and The Little Mermaid. In fact, he was one of the original designers of Ariel and Ursula. Animated on Dragon's Lair and an American Tale. He even provided voices in them from time to time. Stop that bouncing! Stop that bouncing! Wow, that's actually really cool. Yeah, you want to stay away from him, though. What? Why? That's the guy who designed The Little Mermaid and Ursula. Actually, a lot of people assumed she was based on Divine, but there was another inspiration. It was a man by the name of Max Kirby, and he modeled a lot of her movements for us. See, that is so interesting. Why wouldn't you want us to know that? He tells interesting stories to eat people. Jesus with sprinkles. Hi, low! Reminiscing makes me hungry for human flesh. Yeah, so don't give him any attention. <sighs> but Critic, he might have some interesting stories. Nah, he just wants to eat you. But aren't you reviewing a Don Bluth movie? Ooh, which one? Secret of Nim. <gasps> I worked on that film. Really? That's one of my favorite movies of all time. Oh, I have lots of stories about making that film. Did you know we had to change her name from Frisbee to Brisbee because of the toy that you throw? Holy smokes, I had no idea about... Are you eating my toe? No. Then how come I only have nine toes? Coincidence. See, Critic, if we survive this, it's gonna be so much fun! <sighs> I'm gonna regret this, aren't I? Deliciously so, yes. See, deliciously so. <sighs> all right, let's get to it then. <laughs> Celebrating its 40th anniversary. We've talked about Secret of Nim a lot on this show, but we've never done a full-on review. When I think of animation landmarks from the 80s, this Don Bluth masterpiece is always near the top of the list. Having left Disney with several other animators due to their quality of films not representing what they felt the studio could produce, Don Bluth released this film in 1982 and serves as one of the darker and quite frankly more adult family films of that decade. If you know family films in the 80s, you know that's saying a lot. Despite being about cute little mice, this film has a maturity and brutal harshness that was only matched by the emotional and heart-tugging lead. It's one of my favorite movies of all time, and I can't wait to talk about it. And maybe throughout the film we might get an interesting fact or two from one of the animators who worked on it, Philo Barnhart. <laughs> there, see? I think this is going to be very educational for all- Are you putting salt on my head? No. Okay then. Enjoy what could be our embarrassing last episode. This is Secret of Nim. So where a lot of animated films at the time starring furry critters would start out like this. Don't forget your mittens, Dave! Or like this. Rescue Society! Secret of Nim starts out with... Jonathan Brisby was killed today. Let's see Disney start off a mouse movie with that kind of intensity. <laughs> okay, fair enough. The film immediately has a more grown-up way of telling its story that, as a kid watching, made me feel more adult. Even the so-called magical elements introduced in this that were not in the book, I look at less as magical and more as the unknown. 
There's nothing supernatural in this film until after the rats are genetically altered, so my thought is they not only match the intelligence of humans, but they surpass them. Because of this setup, the unknown elements actually make the film more intriguing and adult rather than generic and childish. Or maybe I'm just hyping up Acme's disappearing, reappearing ink. I don't know. Jonathan, wherever you are, your thoughts must comfort her tonight. Don't remember Dumbledore being a rat, but maybe... Oh yeah, yeah, it was a J.K. Rowling tweet. Opening titles, that was interesting how we came by that. I used to bring films in uh, for lunchtime. And one day I brought Howard Hawks The Thing in. Somebody ran and got Don. He says, uh, maybe we ought to do that for, for our title. It all started with The Thing, how about that? Don would listen to you. you know, I mean, he'd have you come and sit down with him whenever he had some time. <laughs> he was always working. Yeah, everyone was. Did take a lot of ideas. That's all to the good. I wish more people did that with their um, staff. We cut to a little mouse named Mrs. Brisby, voiced by the often underappreciated Elizabeth Hartman, who's meeting up with Mr. H's, voiced by Arthur Mallet. I'm so glad you're home. Confounded machine. Now, if you'd excuse me. I've lost my marbles. Sorry, when you have a buffet of sound bites, you go for the obvious one. Did we mention yet a dear loved one was murdered? I don't suppose you would remember me. Yes, you're Mrs. Brisby, and I'm sorry about your husband's death. 80s kids films are like greeting cards that say sorry for insert name here's horrible passing. My son Timothy is so sick. I'm right in the middle of something uh, very important. I understand. Oh, do you? I know I've mentioned this in the past, but Mrs. Brisby has been, and still is, one of my all-time favorite heroes. She's a character that lives in the shadow of someone else. We don't even know her first name, so nothing is expected out of her. Please, sir. I'll do anything to save Timmy. Anything. She's meek, polite, soft-spoken, and isn't someone you'd associate with saving the day or fighting off enemies. She's a tiny little character, and even as tiny little characters go, she's especially tiny. She's a single mom who's often in over her head, which, yes, there's a lot of single moms in anime films, but how many are the main character? She's a great hero not because she's physically strong, super smart, or has no fear, but for the exact opposite reasons. She enters situations she's terrified of, has little understanding about, and possesses no strength to protect herself. And she does all this for the love of her family, which is very easy and quick to identify with. Timothy. Remember Timothy. Some people at the time lost sight of this because she didn't seem like the brightest or strongest. I didn't like the opening of the picture. I thought Mrs. Brisby was a little bit of a twerp. HOW DARE YOU INSULT MRS. BRISBY'S HONOR! But in a time where, yes, a lot of women and kids films are more fleshed out, but others are made too perfect to be interesting, here's a character who has many weaknesses but constantly tackles them to be stronger. I get much more inspired seeing Mrs. Brisby bravely enter this cave than Mulan nonchalantly battle an entire army. Your son must stay in bed. Bundle him up. Brisby goes to Mr. Ages because her son Timmy is sick. Not just because he read the script for the film he's gonna star in, but because he has pneumonia. Ages gives her a medicine, and on her way back, she runs into Jeremy the Crow, played by Dom DeLuise. Uh, what's cooking around here? Nah, nah, that's a different J. Crow. <laughs> Lady, don't sneak up on me like that. I didn't mean to frighten you. I love, too, this movie knows when to use the beautiful Jerry Goldsmith score and when to have it shut the hell up. This comedic scene with him is cute, but goofy music would have ruined it. They spot the house cat named Dragon heading towards him, and if there was silly music here, the scene would fall apart. Does he see you? Yes! He's headed right for us. Fast or slow? Medium. Make that fast. Without the music, though, it's both a little funny and kind of terrifying. It's legit suspenseful not knowing if this is going to be a silly joke or an intense chase. Does he see you? Yes! He's headed right for us. Fast or slow? Medium. Make that fast. I think that was a collective thing. Like allowing your characters to settle, they allowed the soundtrack to settle. Also, there was not going to be anyone bursting into song either. That was done by an off-screen singer. It's almost like a narrator singing. Dream by night, wish by day. See, Critic, he's got all kinds of interesting info. Yeah, is that your hand he's eating? Philo! I'm a sucker for lady fingers. Well, it turns out to be both, as at first, it looks like it's just a rabbit. You got yourself all worked up over a rabbit. You tit! But Don Blue's diehard cat hate attacks as the feline tries hunting him down with the friggin' eye of Sauron. Which I think most cat owners know is a common condition. 
There is no life in the void. Frisbee loses the medicine, but thankfully Jeremy catches it during the chase. Timmy's medicine. Oh, thank you. It is? What? It is? I mean, it is. So Jeremy is just funny enough. Like most parts DeLuise plays in Bluth films, he's a neat bit of levity. He's the character that reminds you, oh yeah, this is for kids as well. Without him, I think you'd have a watership down. That's for kids, but no, it's not. It's for kids, but no, no, it's not. Auntie Shrew. Oh, Auntie. Oh, no. Speaking of kids, we see Brisby's family being approached by the shrew, who's telling them to move their home because the plow is coming through soon. I'm not afraid of the dark. Not. I'm not afraid of the farmer. I can't, yeah. I'm not even scared of drag. As I'm just shocked to find some of these kids were names in the making, like Shannon Doherty and Will Wheaton. I also love they're not just made up of adorable one-liners, they're kind of little shits. Martin. Precocious monster. Bossy bullfrog. Poiled breath. Loud mouth. Shut up, Wesley. Oh, this will all go better when Eric Idle voices him. And no, I can't promise that's the last Timmy to the rescue joke, and neither would you. Timmy gonna die? No, sweetheart. He's just very sick. Tying in again to what this movie doesn't show us, it's interesting how little we see of Jonathan and Timmy, who are arguably the driving forces that set her story in motion. But again, they don't need to be shown. You see the way she talks about Jonathan and the way she looks at her son, you instantly understand the love she has for both of them and connect with why she's putting herself in so many perilous situations. Though I don't know, I think a lot of his sickness is just from putting this thing in the room. I wouldn't be well if I had to sleep with that across from me, it's just another poltergeist waiting to happen. The techniques we were relearning as far back as Sleeping Beauty because Walt Disney at the time said no more of this expense. Expense was just killing them on that film. Well, Rescuers was still using the black line Xerox and they were also not filling in the character's eyes. Done a little like the Hanna-Barbera characters. <laughs> we were sealing off eyes and putting irises and you know, eyelashes and all kinds of things. We got back to using airbrush. We had Fred Craig. He developed color toners for us to use. We were able to give Mrs. Brisby a dark gray line or a red-brown line. The characters were color keyed to the backgrounds. Cash shadows under the characters. Something as simple as that. Most people wouldn't really even notice that, but we sure did because we were very dedicated to the craft. Shooting the characters straight ahead by themselves and then backlining the film, we would set the uh, percentage of the lighting on those cells so that they would appear to be uh, translucent. We used that a lot. Uh, later in Dragon's Lair to do uh, Princess Daphne's gown. The amount of detail was different, and it really didn't take us that much longer to do. Oh wow, that's really interesting. Almost as interesting as him eating your heart there. You silly sicko. <laughs> <laughs> hmm, not bad. And you're delicious. Oh. <laughs> The following day, the house is attacked by the rotoscoper, but Brisby is unable to move Timmy, so she tries to stop the machine. This whole scene is like that quail being shot scene from Bambi stretched out to three minutes. Again, it's interesting, Brisby isn't the one that stops the machine. She rushes in, but doesn't know what to do, leaving the shrew to figure it out. Every scene is like a progression of how braver she gets, which again can't be shown unless we understand how truly terrifying these threats are. Oh, and this ain't a world where you can just cry it out. When someone tears up, you're told to shut up! Stop it. In fairness, this did play better than the original cut. Calm down! Calm down. Get a hold of yourself! She's encouraged to see the great owl, who naturally eats mice, but is said to be the only one who'd be wise enough to help. She puts her life on the line and enters Madonna's cooch, where she finds him waiting. I am the great and powerful owl. Why have you come? The great owl, played by John Carradine, says the only thing to do is to move her house. He doesn't give much detail, though, until she brings up that her name is Brisby and that her husband was Jonathan. Brisby? Mrs. Jonathan Brisby? That dickhole owes me 80 bucks. Go to the rats. As for Nicodemus. Now in the commentary, Don Blue said that the owl and Nicodemus has similar eyes and beards, and that wasn't by accident. Now is this to be taken literally like they're the same and he can transform? They sure do seem like different characters, but they do have similar traits. Do they have some psychic link? Is this from their intelligence growing from Nim? There can be a lot of theories on this, and that's what I like. 
The movie knows what details to give you and what to leave vague. So instead of one of these unknown elements leading to one conclusion, like always follow your heart or your dreams or something, there's a lot of different theories you can draw from it. It's like Tom Bombadil not disappearing when he puts the ring on. It's not sloppy writing if it invites more paths you can travel down rather than dead ends. We had a, a bit of a snag. Almost halfway done with the film, the Whammo Corporation might bring us up on a lawsuit even though original source material is called Mrs. Frisbee and the Rats of Nim. Don said we, we have to start thinking about changing her name. The detrimental part was that we'd lost John Carradine who voiced the part of the owl because we were able to bring all the other actors back. They re-recorded whenever her name was spoken, it became Brisby. Well, we had a genius uh, sound man. <laughs> I believe his name was Dave Horton. We couldn't uh, use digital means to edit, and that includes the soundtrack, which was on magnetically striped film. Where he could, he scraped on the actual <laughs> magnetic tape to kind of blunt the uh, FR sound down to a BR sound, and then he would actually splice a BR sound to the beginning of the name from other places. Frisbee, Mrs. Jonathan Frisbee, Frisbee, Mrs. Jonathan Frisbee. Okay, I'm sorry, I have to interrupt. Is that Tamara's eye? Critic, you are making a mountain out of a molehill. Oh, uh, could you pass the barbecue sauce? Oh, yeah, oh, of course, buddy, here you go. You leave this national treasure alone. We'll be back with whatever's left of us. Merry Christmas, honey. But it's not Christmas, it's July. It must be Christmas, because I got you chime. Chime? Chime. What is chime? Chime is Christmas, or a gift that's so good, it's like Christmas. Continue, husband or boyfriend. No one likes waiting on a paycheck, especially when you've got bills due. Good thing there's chime. That's the thing you said. It is the thing I said. Now you can get your paycheck up to two days early with direct deposit. That's up to two more days to save, pay bills, and generally just feel good about your money situation. Tell me chime is more than just about getting paid early. It is. <gasps> Gasp. It's also an award-winning mobile app, checking account, debit card, and optional saving account. I have never experienced anything better in my life, and I literally poop gold. Well, then what are you waiting for? Hopefully not your paycheck. Ha 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 ha! Get started with Chime today. Applying for a free account takes less than two minutes. Get started at Chime.com slash nostalgia. That's Chime.com slash nostalgia. Oh, can I say the thing most people read fast? No. Banking services and debit card provided by the Bancorp Bank or Stripe Bank NA members at DIC. Early access to direct deposit funds to Depends on payer. Oh, this is the happiest July Christmas I've ever had, because I got you something too. What, what, what? Raycon. Darling! Darling. Lately I've been listening to a lot of Elvis. Bunch of melody, right? You just had to listen to that last performance after you saw the movie. Especially I wanted to see if they dubbed the piano or his voice. I feel like there's different variations of it. You can really go down the rabbit hole with But it. I can go down it with Raycon wireless earbuds. Raycon's everyday earbuds look, feel, and sound better than ever. Yes, with optimized gel tips for perfect in-ear fit, these earbuds are so comfortable and they will not budge. Trust me. I do trust you, even though I'm the one that got the gift for you. Astounding. Raycons offers three sound profiles to match what you're listening to, plus noise isolation and awareness mode, so you can choose to be immersed in sound or be able to hear your surroundings when you need to. Listening to Unchained Melody and Bass Boost just really makes me feel like I'm there, in concert, trying to figure out if I heard the dub version or not. Well, that's wonderful because Raycons gives you eight hours of playtime and 32-hour battery life. Then, when you need to charge, it's super easy. You can even do it wirelessly. Again, remember, I got this for you, but here's a huge selling point. Considering you already bought this, but go ahead. With Raycon, you get the same quality audio as other premium audio brands, but at half the price. Yes, really. really? Yes, really. But that doesn't mean they won't last. I've seen people talking about the Raycons falling three stories, getting lost in rain and sometimes snowstorms, and still working afterwards. Maybe that guy giving a thumbs up will be reassuring. It will be. He is a handsome devil. It's no wonder Raycon's everyday earbuds have over 49,000 five-star reviews. I recommend to anyone eavesdropping to check out Raycon's wireless earbuds. My guess is that you're going to want to leave them a five-star review too. It's very nice of you to say to any perfect strangers and you can add this on top of it. Go to buyraycon.com slash nostalgia today to get 15% off your Raycon order. That's buyraycon.com slash nostalgia to score 15% off. Buyraycon.com slash nostalgia. Oh honey, could it be it's snowing? It's snowing and Christmas in July? No. Oh. See Doug play Guardians of the Galaxy Fridays at 6 p.m. Central Time on Twitch. We also got a new schedule and material six days a week. Hope to see you there. Bruce B goes to the
rose bush where the rats are hidden, but Jeremy interrupts and she tries to get rid of him by saying someone needs to look after her kids. Kids love me and I love kids. Yeah, oh, I love kids. You know, Jeremy's a lot funnier when you consider the possibility he's always high as a kite. I'm in disguise. Uh, where's home? Why well, I got connections. I'm being followed. What am I gonna do with all this string? Miss P, I gotta have it. Ooh, a sparkly. Hey man, where my dookie go? She journeys through the world's creepiest rose bush and stumbles across, I'll just say it, probably everyone's scariest scene in the film, Brutus the guard. Please, I need help. I got a kick out of being scared at movies, and there's certainly a lot of scary stuff in the film. People in their 40s, they'll come up to me and they'll say, uh, thanks for scaring the hell out of me when I was little. I say, I think you're welcome. <laughs> I think it's okay to get scared. It's uh, like an intellectual chili pepper. <laughs> you know you shouldn't eat it, but boy, it's, it's fun when you do and, and you overcome it. A terrifying, but honestly pretty bad guard lets Brisby escape where she stumbles across Mr. Ages. Her seeing the owl impresses him so much that he decides to take her to see Nicodemus, who she discovers is the leader of the rats. She's also introduced to the captain of the guards, Justin, played by Peter Strauss. Okay, just a joke. I didn't mean any harm. It is an honor and a privilege, my lady. And yeah, okay, with all the furries from Lola and Robin Hood, how is nobody thirst for this character? How beautiful. Ma'am? Uh, the lights, they're quite lovely. Even he had a look like, oh, I thought you were talking about me. I will one day take the stage as a professional Chippendale dancer. Justin, Mrs. Brisby. Not Mrs. Jonathan Brisby. Yes, the same. So, she's available. We discover the rats are stealing electricity from the farmer to work on their many projects. Their many X-Men mutant power projects. So they're working on a plan to move from the rose bush so they don't have to steal electricity anymore. But some rats, like one named Jenner, want to keep stealing the power and stay where they are. Hear me! The Thorn Valley plan is the aspiration of idiots and dreamers! Again, some decent commentary on how, for lack of a better way of putting it, with great intelligent power comes great ethical responsibility. Here, it's electricity, but history has shown us people will always fight, steal, or even kill for resources. So even though these creatures sometimes seem smarter than us, they can fall to the same weaknesses. The backgrounds, uh, we had a great group of guys. Ron Diaz, what a painter. There was just nobody like Ron. They were meticulous, beautiful, just flawless. My other friend in the department was Don Moore who I'd met on Star Trek The Motion Picture. It had a looser style, but uh, all those opening shots of um, Nicodemus writing in the book, the candle being lit, that, that's all watercolor washes. That one beautiful background of uh, Mrs. Brisby finally getting into the central area of the rats, colors and everything, that was his. There's an architect named Gaudi that did a lot of cathedrals and things in Spain, natural freeform things, and he, he got a lot of that feeling in there. That's great, really cool. Are we just gonna ignore that you're eating Malcolm's skull? Quiet, critic. You're interrupting the magic. Yeah, it just doesn't faze me anymore. We'll be killed. Not if we got them first. He means war. Brisby is taken to the council, and for being such intelligent creatures, they're pretty easily led. We could move the Brisby home to safety. Send her away. We are but your humble servant. I second the motion. Hear, hear. But hey, some good voice acting. I, I second, second the motion. motion. Hear, hear. They actually caricatured the rat to look like me at the time. I was very skinny, dark-haired. <laughs> I smell an opportunity. Jenner and his Jeff Dunham eyebrows have a plan to sabotage the moving of the house, but it'll have to wait as, again, we kind of have to remind ourselves there's kid stuff in this too. I know you're in league with those rats. Teresa, Martin! Feed on him, children! The rats, they're friendly. Good tonight. Stay. He lets them know Brisby is with the rats and they're gonna move their house, but they don't believe it. Nothing much to comment on except how hard did the shrew pull on this kid's arm? There you are. <laughs> Brisby is introduced to Nicodemus, played by Derek Jacoby. A very combustible Derek Jacoby. Who tells her that the rats were experimented on by Nim, making them smarter than anyone could have imagined. Also, it was Jonathan that allowed them to escape when he could have just fled on his own. My family is... I know of your needs. 
There was a lot of pencil, what we call pencil mileage on him. All that fur and everything had to follow through from frame to frame. Glowing eye effects for uh, both the owl and Nicodemus was actually a series of masks. It would cut the eyes out. They had hundreds of these things corresponding with the drawings. They would dial up the uh, bottom light. They also used a diffuse filter on the camera to fuzz it out so it didn't have a hard edge. When they needed him to get excited, they would dial up the percentage so that they got brighter. It is grainy, but that, that only adds to it. She also discovers exactly how Jonathan died from reading Nicodemus' journal. And tell me this isn't the most heartbreaking delivery from Elizabeth Hartman. He was ki uh, killed t today while drugging the farmer's cat. She also discovers that Jonathan never told her about the rats because the injection slowed their aging process. You see, you would have grown old while he remained young. Me and Mr. Ages were like 11 bajillion years old. She's given something only known as the stone, which again is kept very vague as to what it is and what it can do. But it has a power when worn by someone with a courageous heart. You can unlock any door if you only have the key. I feel like that's the equivalent of... She only won because I lost. I volunteer for Dragon. Oh no, Mrs. Brisby. Another element that invites a lot of intrigue is why Brisby volunteers to drug Dragon while they move her house. Again, there can be a lot of reasons. Maybe she wanted to make up for not saving her kids before. Maybe she feels she's not doing enough to help out. Maybe she thinks doing so somehow makes Jonathan's death mean something. Even she's not entirely sure. Thank you. Oh, I must be crazy. Goodbye. I must be crazy. The character is so good though, it doesn't need to be explained. You can put your own reason in serving as a Rorschach test. On that note, the scene of her drugging him is also mad intense. It's not even when she actually does it, it's the build up to it. Again, the lack of music really lets the realism of the scenario sink in. I don't believe I can do this. Yes, you can. Concentrate on the bow. Don't look at the door. She's caught by a kid in the house though and kept as a pet, allowing her to hear a phone call from Nim, which plans to destroy the rose bush holding the rats. I love how this is essentially a huge cover up and they're trying to destroy information of what they created, but the farmer's just happy it's a free service. Bulldoze that rose bush right out of there. I want those rats exterminated. Now, uh, there's no charge or anything. I just have to take an eye exam? Yeah, I'm fine with that. Frisbee escapes just as Jasper cuts the line, dropping the house on Nicodemus, killing him instantly. One day we shall journey to Thorn Valley, just as Nicodemus wanted. But not now. It will be placed on permanent... <sighs> Frisbee tells them that Nim is coming, but Jenner tries to stop her, resulting in Justin pointing together that he killed Nicodemus. <laughs> Jesus, this is a hard G. This is a G movie, man. Jenner is killed, but remember, this is a Don Bluth film. Everything wants to kill you, even your home. The blob, it's sinking. What? Here, two of these lines together. Throw the line, Justin. That's me. <laughs> I know I sound like a broken record, but again, this scene is crazy intense. Mother, what's all that black stuff? Mother! <laughs> Shut up, Wesley! Frisbee tries so many times to save them that they eventually have to pull her back, fighting all the way. This results in the stone taking on supernatural properties, allowing her to lift the house to safety. So in the story clearly showing a battle between nature and science, I like that the unknown plays a big part at the end. I don't think it's far-fetched to say that the unknown elements, especially the stone, have a strong connection to faith. I doubt it's a coincidence some of this imagery is very similar to religious imagery. The meek and kind obtain otherworldly abilities. There's even some stigmata as the stone burns her at first, but she still bravely grabs it, taking on the pain. In the book, there is not a lot of closure for who lives and who dies. So that's, that was an invention of Don's. I think it was a good call. He knew there was no magic amulet in the, <laughs> in the original book, 
But he needed to come up with some kind of vehicle where she could become the hero. Here they were trying to save her all the time, and she ends up saving all of them. But he got a lot of hell for that. <laughs> By keeping it vague what the stone exactly is, I think it equals more than just believe in magic. Kindness and a simple acceptance of what you don't understand can also have a great power. Really is kind of a religious uh, uh, imagery. They even asked John Pomeroy, very staunch Catholic, how do you feel about this, John? Do you think this is going to fly or is this going to offend people? He says, no, I think it's great. It symbolically shows how she's grown. She's taken on more of a status than, than just this little widowed field mouse. <laughs> now they're all bowing to her, you know? <laughs> and yeah, did I mention yet that music's spectacular? As you'd imagine, the day is saved as both Brisby and the rats move, Timmy ultimately gets better to let us down in the future, and even Jeremy finds a loved one to make a nest with. <laughs> yeah, this wasn't really about the crows, but by god that's a pretty image to end on. And that was The Secret of Nim. It only gets better every time I see it. And sure, I can't pretend everything I talked about here was intentional, but that doesn't mean it still isn't there. I feel like there's so many ways to look at this movie and so many themes and ideas you can take away from it. Because they know what to be detailed about and what to be vague about. It invites so many more ideas rather than just limited to a select few. But even taking that out of it, it's just a simple, relatable story about a mother trying to protect her kids. It's a wonderful combination of the complex and the simple, making a film that not surprisingly works for kids and adults. The animation is fantastic, the acting emotional, the music astounding, even the silent moments are really powerful. It's still one of my favorite movies all these years later, and it only gets closer to my heart every passing day. And I'd like to thank Phyla Barnhart for sharing so many great stories with us, even if it did cost me a good chunk of my cast. There, was it so hard listening to animation history? Don't get angry, Tamara. It makes for bad leftovers. So sorry. You know what happened in my childhood to make me write stuff like this? Seeing films that I worked on. That's fair. Our distribution was going to be through United Artists, so it was a press conference. They combined Victor Victoria with our production. All the Victor Victoria people were touring through the studio all day. I felt a pair of eyes on me, you know how that feels. And I turned around and it was Julie Anders. I said, yeah, you won't remember me, but you might remember my father. Uh, from Mary Poppins' days. She says, really? Who is your father? And I said, Dale Barnhart. And she says, does that mean you're... Are you little Philo? Are you little Philo? <laughs> you could have knocked me over with a feather. <laughs> Shut up, Wesley. Hey everybody, Cameo for Charity is still going great, and all through the month of July, we're doing Raise a Child. Raise a Child is the nationwide leader in the recruitment and support of all prospective parents. They host free information events and parent matching events to help support growing families, and through the process of fostering and fostering to adopt, they offer resources and guidance. So if you want a cameo from me saying happy birthday or good luck or whatever, just click on the link below and the money won't be going to me, it'll be going to this wonderful organization. And even if you're like, screw your face, I don't want a cameo from you at all, well at least give this organization a look. It's got a great rating on Charity Navigator and it's well worth your time. Click on the link and check it out. <laughs>